end. All right. So yeah, thanks for that sharing that, Sarah. That, that I'm glad to hear the excitement about it. Uh, that's great news. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions as best I can and talk through it. Uh, the feature is not fully developed yet, so I don't have like a fully working demo. We're actually, it's going to be very close for the 15.9 release. Like we're going to be getting it in just before the release cutoff date, most likely. So um, it, it's a little bit difficult to show at the moment, but probably in three weeks time, it'll be available in the product and, and you can get your hands on it and actually play with it. And in the meantime, I can show you mocks and I can kind of talk through what to expect, um, which should give you a pretty good sense for what the experience will be like as soon as we release it. Awesome. Yeah, I think even it's kind of <clears throat> hammering out some of the expected operation just so we get a rough idea of whether, you know, one of the main concerns even I, I kind of cropped up when I was discussing it is whether we're making any kind of inference that we're kind of certifying saying, hey, your licenses are all OK because you're using, you know, permissive licenses if we're making some sort of judgment call telling them that hey you're all, you're using all MIT here so you're good to go I, as long as we're kind of letting them say hey uh, it looks like it. I had a quick look at the mockups on the UX side and it looks like we're letting you know we're saying if this license type shows up you know get this approver in and it looks kind of more logic flow rather than us making some sort of value statement or judgment on whether it's an appropriate license to use or not we're just saying that this is the license so do you need an approver or not if that's the case I think we're probably in a good position, but that's one of the, yeah. kind of the main things that was in my mind anyway. No, it would be up to you as a member of the legal team to define those policies. So you get mm -hmm. to decide what requires an approval and what does not. Um, awesome. So I can show you, Dominic is at least somewhat familiar with this. I can show you the workflow for our security policies today. And it's very, very going to be very, very similar. Um, so just for an initial demo and, and for some initial understanding, here I've got this simple notes demo. This is a, a potential development project, right? It's a Python project where developers are writing code. And actually we have this sort of functionality in GitLab today. You go and manage it under settings and merge requests. But one of the challenges here, um, you know, we have this license check functionality one of the challenges is that maintainers can go in and they can edit this, they can delete it. They can just say, oh, you know, I'm gonna toggle this down to zero, merge my merge request in, and then I'll toggle it right back up to one after the merge request goes through. So anyway, there are a lot of challenges with the current approach. We plan to deprecate this license check functionality in 15.9 and the new functionality will be managed under security and compliance in this policies page. And the way this works is all of these policies are actually stored as code in YAML in a separate repository uh, that gets linked up to this development project. So only the project owners are able to manage that linking. So if I come up here to edit policy project, you'll see this project is linked. Simple Notes Demo is linked to a different project called Simple Notes Demo Dash Security Policy Project. And if I take just a minute and I come up into this subgroup level, and here I've got my policy project. In here, there's it's a very Spartan project. I mean, it's it's empty, right? Like you've got just this policy.yaml file, and this is what defines the policies for any project that is linked to the security policy project. So all, all of that complexity, what it does, and it, it may be better showed. Um, in this diagram that we have in our documentation. So we support like a one-to-many linking. You can also link these up at the group or the subgroup level uh, for ease of management across projects. But what this does is it allows you to have a separate set of maintainers for your security and compliance policies compared to who's a developer and maintainer for your development project, um, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. so that's sort of just just like the foundational background that is important to understand coming into this. Um, as far as actually managing the policies themselves, you don't have to know all of this YAML in order to do that because we've provided a nice rules editor, like a visual workflow to help guide you through the process um, of generating that YAML. So if I come in, to create a new policy and 
we'll create a scan result policy. That'll be the kind that you'll use for your license policies. Right now you can filter off of which scanners you want and define like your criteria here. It's going to be very similar. We're just going to be adding an extra dropdown in front of this where you can pick either a security scanning or license scanning. And if you pick license scanning, this is where I have to come over to the mock, then it gives you all of this license criteria. So you can either pick to require approval when specific licenses are found, or you can change this matching dropdown. The other option here is accept. So you can say finds any license except for licenses A, B, C, and D. So you can either go on a, um, you know, uh, an allow list or a deny list, essentially. You can say, um, you know, I want to specifically deny these licenses, or you can flip that around and say, I want to block all licenses by default and only allow these defined licenses that we've outlined. A and you can add those approvals one by one. That's interesting. So I was thinking in terms of like what open source licenses to be somewhere in excess of like 200. So I was thinking we might have to create an individual rule for every single type, but we can pretty much say if it's one of these, like, you know, what we consider our acceptable licenses, it doesn't mm -hmm. need approval. But if it's something that's on our either, if it's, you know, a defined list say, of ones that we've identified as unacceptable or potentially unacceptable, we would push that to require an approver. And if it's not any of those, it would we could still have another rule to push everything else to approver as well. That's that's exactly right. Yep. So here's awesome. here's the UX mock of these drop downs. Right. So you can pick either matching or accept, and then you go through and pick individual licenses. And you're right. There are actually more than like 500, I think, that we've got <laughs> listed in our database, plus others that, you know, sometimes don't match the patterns that we've got in our database that you would have to enter manually in the YAML. Uh, but that way, as you go through and review a license and decide that it's acceptable, then you could add that into the list of approved licenses so that you don't have to go through and review it again. Cool. Oh, that's really good. That's it's it, it's kind of more what I was thinking from looking at those UX flows that it's not like that. It's, there's no kind of judgment in those saying, you know, hey, you should put your code under MIT because it's you know very permissive, whatnot. It's more just saying, hey, we're the legal team. If this license comes into our project, we want to know. Let us approve it. Correct. That seems a lot. Yeah, that's 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 the happy path here. <laughs> really yeah, yeah. So you're so you're defining, and then you can define who's allowed to approve. You know, it can be a group, it can be individuals. You can require multiple approvers. Um, you know, it's up to you on you know what level of scrutiny you want to put around that. Um, that's generally the setup workflow. Once you do this and you get it right, you'll see it'll auto generate that YAML on the side. So let me flip back to like the live, you know, vulnerability management one. So. You can see as I type, it's it's updating this YAML. If you prefer to edit it in YAML mode, you can toggle that up top here. So, uh, you know, if there's for some reason a license that's not listed in our dropdown, you know, you can always add that custom. But all of this ends up generating a merge request back into that other linked security policy project, and then of course that merge request itself can go through a set of approvals if you would like so that no one person can unilaterally you know change the approval criteria so you could you know set up your security policy project to require two people to approve any changes to policies there um, mm -hmm. is typically the recommended path uh, you know that way you have a little bit more like compliance assurance that no one is just going around suddenly changing the policies without due process and due review. But in theory, it could be two members on, say, the security side without any legal involvement could put through a change, just so I'm clear. They could approve a change of policy. So say, I'm saying anyone who's in this uh, pol um, security policy area or security compliance area, yeah, and they any change one of the rules. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's right. Anyone in this, security policy group could give their approval, but it would require two people. So you would have to have two eyes on it. And you could also set up like a code owner. Well, code owners wouldn't work because it's all in one file. I'm just thinking creatively here. I guess Yeah, that's true. So the security <laughs> team, yeah, that, that is true. Um, I think some of this, I think some of this will eventually get addressed on our roadmap. Uh, 
but yes, you're right. The, the security team potentially could approve your changes, um, but it would have to go through another person, you know, so you could set it up so that, uh, you know, permissions wise, and it, it at least lowers the surface that you have to monitor because you only have a few people in here and you only have one project that you need to monitor. If we want to avoid any concern at all, uh, we could require security and legal approval for every single change to that project. True. Many changes, will, like you will be paying the security only thing that will just rubber stamp and the other way around, but mm -hmm. that could avoid if there's a concern about approvals. Or even like, is there a fail safe workaround in just having some sort of notification get sent out whenever a, a policy gets changed or edited in some way or deleted just that there's something that alerts us to let us know that there has been a change so we can go in and check say hey oh this was fine this was you know we've been collaborating on and security have made the change for us or i don't know that i can see it might be fine i might be overthinking it but it's just something in my mind that obviously that we would want some sort of either auditing you know paper trail that we know that yeah. changes change happened just so we can kind of figure out what's happened. There's a, so, there's so a trail uh, the, there, in the Git repository. Yeah, the, there's a trail in a few places. So, right, because it's a Git repository, you have all of your commits and your history. So, that, you know, automatically you get that. Like, I can come in here and I can see here all the changes that I've made to this project. And I can click mm -hmm. on any of these and see, like, who's approved it. But then you also have your audit log, um, which this doesn't really apply because um, in my case, you know, this doesn't apply because uh, I've just been self-approving and merging things in, but you would be able to see, like if somebody changed the approval rules, you would be able to see that here. Um, uh, we also cool. have our aud streaming audit events. And I think we actually added in support for Git commits as part of that. So if you have a place to stream those out somewhere, you could monitor that if you wanted to. Um, anyway, there are several ways of auditing this depending on how you want to do it. We also have the compliance report, which flags things that haven't had an adequate number of approvers. But at a bare minimum, it's all logged there in that Git history. That's probably your primary yeah. source of audit information. No, that's pretty helpful. And I, I, for the most part, I don't expect people will go in and change it. Like, there's no real reason, especially with that second site. There's still another chance to catch it if someone just does something, thinking it's having a much smaller sure. impact than what it's actually going to have. So it's something I'll just I'll I'll flag just on our side, just so we have you know some time to think it through. But at least we have it's good to know that we have that auditing function there to kind of go back and see. So let's see. So this is going to roll out for all users. That's good. And we can see the logic flow isn't inferring in any way that we're recommending a certain license over another. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, only as much as you define it as a, you know, as in your policy as the legal team. Sure. And actually, where, where, where are we pulling those license types from? That was one of the things we've been discussing. Uh, let's see. I'm just curious, if we, it's a, so I think, is it SBDX maybe, or there are certain uh, places online? That... No, I think we are pulling it from SBDX. I can pull up the exact place for you, but yeah, we, we I, I'll probably have to take that as a follow-up. I think yeah, we are yeah, pulling it from SBDX, but um, I know I have the link here somewhere to where we're pulling it from. I'll just have to dig for it a little bit. No, or it's more just if it's like a static list that we're pulling like at once in time, or if it's updating as new items get added to that, that'd be interesting to know. I believe it is updated. Let's see. Oh, here it is. We feed it from this link. Yep. So it is from SPDX. It's the SPDX license list. Awesome. And this has like over 500 licenses in it right now. And I know it's updated all the time too. Cool. So that's great. So we don't have to worry about getting new licenses added to it at any point. That's great. Um, but like I said, if there are licenses and there are some licenses that are not included, um, you can just add those in the YAML uh, directly, if that makes sense. 
So for adding them, what would that look like? It's also, I saw you you had the editor open there for adding it in YAML, but I'm thinking from the legal perspective, if we're trying to add it, is it like just like a we're looking for I suppose the identifier from SPDX or what the equivalent of this, so like the the name of the licenses that we'd be putting in. Yeah, so here where it says licenses allowed, right now it's an empty array because it's just catching everything. And cool. this okay. it's a little bit hard to bridge this gap between like mock-up and what we've got in the product. So bear with me. But if I come back in here and, and go to edit one of these policies, um, this would basically just be um, you know, you would edit it something like this. So if I can get in here, it's a few clicks. <laughs> Right. So, you know, just like it adds it here in additional dashes, like instead of severities, suppose this is your, these are your um, licenses underscore allowed, I think is the key that we went off of. So you would just add it here, like my custom license, you know, GitLab EE license or, or what whatnot. Um, you would just add those like that as text. Cool. And if there is no license file in a library, um, how would it react or have we come across that scenario yet? Um, yeah, so if we're not able to identify the license, we just report it up as unknown. Okay. Cool. That gives us actually quite a lot of it's a lot more customizable than I, I I was thinking, obviously, like far more granular of us having to input everything, having to try and keep that list up to date in the long term. But it's cool. Yeah, it's, it's designed very well that we don't have to worry about those kind of considerations long term. And um, you mentioned the current operation of the license compliance tool that's already in place. That is that can be circumvented by maintainers. Was that what you're saying? Yeah. Yep. And has that been one of the main drivers for bringing this in or is there any other kind of use case that's captured by this updated tool than what was in the old one? Yeah, the, the new tool captures several use cases. So we also have the ability now to do that matching or excludes, I um, know. which is new, whereas before we could only deny matching licenses. So we didn't have that accept, you know, that accept functionality. Um, and then the other big thing that we're rolling out is just improved accuracy. So we have, you know, our current uh, engine only detects a small handful of licenses. I think we only detect like 12 different types of licenses. And even then we've had reports of all kinds of inaccuracies related to our license detection that, you know, we haven't been able to properly address. And so, um, just for your understanding, we're actually redoing the way that we do the license scanning entirely, re-architecting it. And I'll spare you some of the details of this. I'll try to keep it pretty high level, but essentially just by running dependency and container scanning, um, actually just dependency scanning to start with, and that will be a requirement. So, um, you know, you will have to have dependency scanning running in the repository. But that's going to generate just a list of the dependencies that exist in the project. We won't attempt to do any license scanning down here in the CI pipeline. Um, instead, we'll just report up a list of dependencies. Those are going to be stored in our backend database. And what we've done is we've created a bunch of workflows in uh, GCP, and Iris was involved in the legal side of this but we're querying out to the APIs of all the various upstream registries. And we're pulling the license data out of the package metadata, or in some cases, there is no API to call. And so we're actually analyzing the license files themselves. Um, it, it just kind of depends on the registry. But we're compiling all of that into a set of CSV files that you know, contain that license data and we're bringing that into our database. So we have that information for, you know, the vast, vast majority of open source components that are out there across all of the major registries. And then we use that information in this license match job to compare it to the dependencies that exist in your project so that we can surface up those licenses. 
Um, so it is a little bit different because we're not extracting the metadata as part of the CI pipeline. We're relying on that centralized database, but that's allowing us to be far more accurate um, because the license data isn't always carried down and it's not always carried down accurately into the package that's brought down into your local local um, build environment. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that, I, I can see why she, she's been like talking to me about it. It did sound very exciting. So uh, yeah, I think from my perspective, it sounds like we're, it's a, a yeah, far more accurate um, model of what we're using. I know because we've been, as part of some, a project we were working on recently with like product development teams, we've pulled in a step for reviewing licensing quite manually. And it's something we'll, you know, we'll still continue to work with the product team as they have new dependencies come into as part of the product development flow. But I can see this having like a massive impact on that project long term as well. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, you mentioned it's going to be close to the, the wire to get it in for 15.9. I assume documentation probably then is still a work in progress, right? Correct. Yep. Cool. Uh, would it be possible to get access to a late, like a draft close once it's kind of at some stage kind of close to being workable? Um, honestly, we are doing everything we can just to get it out the door. So we've had other customers ask to be like beta testers of this as well. And it's not something that we can easily beta test. I think everyone is just going to have to wait until we officially release it. It's just okay. going to come out all at once, unfortunately. But no, That's fine. Uh, it's more out of curiosity than anything else. But uh, I'm trying to think, is there anything else on, was it going to... 15.9 just it's going to land on us quickly so more I'm just trying to think if there's any need for us to from the liability and the same side I think we're, we're we're fine on that no I, I think I think we're good I am um, like I, I assume the default when it, it when it goes live is that it will have zero rules anyway in it right every customer who wants to use this has to go in and start creating yeah. their own rules from the yeah cool so yeah. as long as there's no kind of default setup or anything that could be the only other little edge case that might catch us out but yeah, so far that sounds actually, that's yeah, exactly all the information I needed to know for now. It sounds like it's, you know, exactly what we've kind of dreamt of at various points over the last year. We talked about having a nice licensing solution as opposed to a lot of it is obviously very manual as you're probably used to. It's like, even when we looked at the old licensing checker tool as part of our product development work, we the gaps in it just meant it was not something we could rely on. So right. this is, yeah, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> Great work. So probably the other big question, Dominic, for you, um, is where are we at with rolling out dependency scanning across the organization and how can we make sure that that's enabled? Because that is a requirement without dependency scanning, we can't get the license data. All of our main projects have it. Uh, see all of the individual components that left have to look in our inventory and see which one have been flagged. Uh, but most is already done, so it wouldn't be a huge lift to actually only add it. Uh, yeah, especially like it doesn't fail the job or anything. It's just just to get the data in. It's a, yeah, just to get the data. It's a, it would be simple, but but most already has it for sure. I can't uh, I can't give you numbers, but it's that's okay. Most places. But okay. We're to hit that fifty nine release date for for getting the dependency scanning in place across the project, yeah. If yeah, you want I mean, to be able to use it, then yes, you you will have okay. to have dependency scanning enabled. Awesome. Um, but it, it is enabled for the main GitLab project, for Gitly, for the runner, for, for all of our main components. If something does not have it, it would be like we, we fork a third-party dependency to put a patch in it, and may, then it is a sub-sub-sub dependency. Maybe that doesn't have it, but it wouldn't be a big ask to add it anyway. Got it. Okay. Um. That sounds good. Just a few other things to note about this as well is that it does, the license data does get driven off of that Cyclone DX file. So if there is a project with a language or something that we don't support, I think, um, oh, I'm, I'm uh, forgetting the name of the project for a moment, but I know we have at least one project where dependency scanning doesn't find the dependencies. Um, in those cases, if you're able to generate a Cyclone DX file listing out the components that are included in the project, then we will be able to still do license scanning against it just by providing that Cyclone DX file as part of a job, order, job artifact. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. And then, 
yeah, otherwise we're really looking forward to, to rolling this out. It'd be great if we can start dog fooding it right away and um, would love to get any feedback that you have to share once you actually start using it. Yeah, oh, definitely. We're like I said, even from the UX mockups that I've seen on one of the other issues you shared, and what we've kind of gone through there, it looks a lot more logical than I think initial in the background. My worry was maybe there was some sort of like subjective element of us saying, hey, this is a good license to use or this isn't a good license. So with the kind of logic flow as we have it now, it's, you know, all those fears kind of go away. And it, like I said, the other words was like maintenance of it. Admin side is completely taken care of because the list is updating dynamically. So for the most part, that's me sort of for now. I'll take it away and have a think about it. If anything else crops up, I'll pop into the issue. And also I'll talk to Iris next week to bring her up to speed as well. So we may have one or two follow-ons. But in the meantime, yeah, in terms of like, if there's anything else you need from legal, yeah, just ping me on that issue. I'll be here all week. And where are you yeah, happy to go with? I know we'd had myself and Dominic were chatting briefly on the issue earlier just about how to do it. In the past, we've always pushed these into confidential legal issues just to, you know, make sure we don't prejudice ourselves we'll by need a sharing here because of the way this works like we need some we need to have an approver it needs to be someone yeah so so that will be a, a person or a group from legal uh, yeah i think within legal products we kind of from there and create the yeah issue. that's within legal products about three or four of us who handle the licensing side the other side are kind of more focused on marketing so i can give you the three names if we can get like that group spun up we can rely on something like that yeah, and think... do that I actually don't know how groups are created. I guess you have to open an access request or something like that. And then IT will uh, handle that. Cool. I'll have a look into that. Yeah, I did want to highlight, uh, Sarah, just that we are calling the licenses out as denied or allowed. Um, you know, This is all based off of the policy that you've defined, but this is what it looks like in the merge request, just so you can get a view into that. So in this case, we're introducing a, pol a license that's not allowed it's going to show up here as denied and then the merge will be blocked and it'll be pending approval from, you know, based off of that rule that you've defined from a member Fair of the, the legal team. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's time back to the policy rather than it was kind yep. of making that's that exactly recommendation. Right. Cool. Perfect. No, that sounds great. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Appreciate the time today. Look forward to rolling this out uh, at the end of the month. Awesome. Thanks folks. Thank Take care. Bye. Bye.